college with an associate's degree in x-ray and went on to Scott Community College for her training in echocardiography. So please join me in welcoming our speakers this afternoon. Well, thanks for coming today. We're going to learn about echo, you know, as we've uh, listened to several different people earlier today, echo is really a bedrock of heart failure diagnosis. And so <clears throat> as part of my training and learning and studying for the advanced cardiac sonography board exam, uh, you know, I, I went into the exam studying very confident, thinking that I was going to do really, really well. And in that studying process, I learned, you know, I really don't know much at all. Even though I'm working at this great facility, we see everything, we do everything in the world of echo. And so as somebody who has an endless knowledge of, of wanting to obtain knowledge and wanting to pursue and do really well, uh, I tried to find different resources. And one of the things that I found uh, as I was scrolling through my phone late one night was, a, was an app called Masterclass. Has anybody heard of Masterclass before? Well, Masterclass, you can, uh, once I downloaded it, I had, you had to pay for it, but once you go through that, you can find different classes and, and they have them um, anywhere from leadership to running an organization to presenting, for example. And a couple of those, uh, one of them was from uh, the women's head basketball coach at the University of Connecticut named Gino Ariema. And in about a week, he will be the winningest basketball coach in Division I history. And he teaches a class on leading winning teams. As you scroll through there down, you'll find uh, a video by a man uh, by the name of Chris Voss, who is a former FBI uh, agent, and his specialty was in hostage negotiation. Now, as I was looking through all of these classes, one of them that really piqued my interest was by a, name, by a man named Daniel Pink. And Daniel taught the art of sales and persuasion. And in this class, he talked about how Pixar, which is an animated movie uh, company that is now um, owned by Disney, and how they narrate all of their movies from Toy Story to Finding Nemo. And it came up with this six basic structure. And how they narrate every single movie is they reduce us to six different lines. And they call this the Pixar pitch and it goes once upon a time. Da, 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 da. Every day, da, 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 da. one day, da, 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 da. because of that, ba, 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 ba. because of that, ba, 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 ba. until finally. And so when I was asked to come and talk about echocardiography, um, and after hearing this, I thought, okay, how does echo and how would I make a movie, a documentary, or a Pixar film about echo? And I came up with this. So once upon a time, heart failure numbers were low in this country. And it really wasn't until the 1950s that heart disease and cardiovascular disease was the main killer of humans. Every day, we were exercising and we were eating more of a well-rounded diet. One day, technology, our cell phones, our computers, our way of life and how we do things changed. We're now sitting in front of the computer for extended hours uh, a day. We're now eating fast food because we're so busy that I'm just going to run through the drive through really quick, get a bite to eat and get back to work. And also, we now have sedentary behavior because I would rather sit on my phone and text and play games and do this and that as opposed to exercise. Because of that, we now have high triglycerides hypertension, coronary artery disease, and a decrease in physical activity. Because of that, we have an increase in cardiovascular disease that estimates between 40 to $60 billion in our medical system annually. So until finally, we reach a point where we have record numbers of heart failure, and now you have to go see Dr. Sparrow and Dr. Bardwaj to save your life. 
And so, you know, if, if I was creating a film like that, I'm not sure I wouldn't make a whole lot of money because it's kind of depressing, but that's kind of the world that we live in right now. And as we continue, we will start to see numbers by 2030 of eight and a half million patients having heart failure. And as we try to explain this, we look at several different maps and the disease processes or the comorbidities that attribute to heart failure. And so this map is heart failure death rates from 2018 to 2020. And we can tell that we have a real problem in the middle and deep south of our country because boy, do we love fried food. So as we continue on, look at other comorbidities, we look at obesity rates specifically in the middle of the country and down south. Now, these maps, uh, we're gonna see how they correlate and how they're intertwined with heart failure. So we'll move into cigarette smoking. We still have a cigarette smoking issue within our country, specifically in the central region and deep south. As we look at diabetes and obesity, we see a lot of purple. And as we look at the map, we see that we have obesity rates and diabetes and purple is not good and we have a lot of purple in this country when we move in and we look at heart failure it looks like an almost identical map to when you look at hypertension when we then move into our overall physical inactivity we see that this also plays into us having a heart failure uh, and these maps look very similar now it is estimated that about 80% of people who have a gym membership don't even go. So they just give a local donation to the YMCA every month. But if we can get people to exercise more, to, to go back into the 18th and 19th century where you're just, you're dancing, where you're out walking, where you're running to get your physical activity, instead of paying to go to a gym, we would see some of these numbers start to come down. Now, when we look at heart failure and the introduction of heart failure, we really see that we find two different main types. We're looking at heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And the most common type that we find is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or diastolic dysfunction. And this is a clinical syndrome resulting from the inability of the heart to meet the perfusion needs of the body. There are several different ways that uh, we can diagnose this and we can risk stratify that whether it's AHA guidelines or the New York uh, Heart Association heart failure classification, we can classify these patients and track them over time. Some of these causes of congestive heart failure are due to coronary artery disease, hypertension, cardiomyopathy, valvular heart disease, and even in some cases, lung disease. All of these factors are weakening the squeeze of the heart and uh, increasing the workload on the heart, leading to impaired pumping. Symptoms that we most commonly associate with heart failure is fluid buildup back into the lungs, shortness of breath on exertion, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and peripheral edema. Now, when patients come into the echo lab and we need to image them, we need to have them lay on their left side so that the heart falls to the front of the chest. But in heart failure, when you lean to the left side, it puts more of a stress on your heart. And so as we're scanning these patients, it's not uncommon for them to get really short of breath or even have this feeling of drowning. So patients who come in with heart failure, they explain that laying on their right side is better for sleeping because it moves the heart away from the chest cavity and relieves the strain on the heart. When we look at life expectancy with heart failure, once you're diagnosed with heart failure, 50% make that five-year mark. 10 years go by, we're now at a 35% survival rate. When we look more closely at these uh, comorbidities or factors of heart failure, we first look at obesity. So starting with obesity, we see that over the years, this epidemic has progressed. It's now estimated that by the year 2030, more than 50% of the adult population will be considered obese, making it a fit and healthy appearance less common for the minority. Sedentary lifestyle. Sedentary lifestyle leads to weight gain, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol. When we look at smoking and lung disease, 
when we specifically try to do echocardiograms, it makes our job that much harder because we have an increased air or enlarged alveolar airspace. We've all seen the traditional image of healthy lungs versus smoker's lungs, but we can also correlate that with overall echo images. So if you have good, healthy lungs who, of a patient who doesn't smoke, most often you're going to have images that look really, really well, and we can see the squeeze of the heart. Now, patients who have COPD or emphysema, when we try to scan them, you really don't know where the left ventricle starts or stops, and we get this hazy COPD-like view of the heart, which makes it very difficult for us to do our jobs. Now, we do have ultrasound contrast that we can give these patients so that they get a good test, but this just shows the difference between non-smoking and smoking. Next would be diabetes. Diabetes is rampant in our country uh, as well, specifically type 2 diabetes. And when we get to a point where insulin cannot bind to the uh, receptor, we start to get a large accumulation of sugar in our blood. And over time, that can cause an erosion of the vessels within inside our body. Now, in hypertension, like Dr. Bardwash talked about earlier, was that your uh, vessels in the body are kind of like steel pipes. They don't contract really well. They don't push the blood through uh, as well as they should. When you contrast that with a healthy blood pressure, you can see how overall well these vessels then contract and move the blood. Coronary artery disease. Coronary artery disease is something that we check for on every echo. Specifically, we're looking at how the walls contract and how they relax. If we see an area of the heart that does not contract equally or symmetrically, that can indicate that we have a blockage in one of the coronary arteries. So specifically in the field of echo, what we'll do to diagnose ischemic heart disease is we'll do a cardiac stress echo or a stress test. So we'll put these patients on a treadmill. We'll get them to 85% of their max heart rate. We'll then stop the treadmill. They'll run over, lay down on a bed, and we'll do additional images of the heart. Now, this image on the, this white image here is that of a normal patient. This is a normal symmetrical squeeze of the heart. However, then when we put this patient on a treadmill, have them exercise, and then bring them back and take additional images, we now can find that we have an area of the heart that does not squeeze very well. Now, through established guidelines, we can tell that by these different views, we have different wall segments, and these different wall segments correlate to different coronary arteries. So when we see this in our lab, we know that when we tell the physician, hey, I'm seeing an issue in the apex of the left ventricle, that correlates to the left anterior descending artery. They know exactly where to go before they take them for a cardiac cath. So not only are we worried about uh, coronary artery disease due to atherosclerosis, but we're also worried about the stroke risk. So as we build up um, atherosclerosis in our bodies, we'll also have this uh, buildup of thrombus burden as well over time if this is not treated. If that breaks off, that can cause a stroke. Now, over time, there are several different things that we can do uh, outside of medications. One specifically is we can look at this vessel. We can determine at what rate or what percentage this coronary artery is blocked, and then we can do intervention. Typically, patients are not exhibiting chest pain uh, symptoms until these coronary arteries get about 70% blocked. So that's another key uh, aspect for stress echo as well, is that once we see wall motion abnormalities and these chest pains, we can tell that it's time for coronary intervention. So by doing coronary intervention, we'll take these patients to the cath lab and they'll do coronary artery stenting. So we find that we have a, a buildup of plaque within inside this vessel. We'll introduce a, a wire into the groin. The cardiologist will run uh, a stent up into the area that's affected expand a stent over a balloon, and we will now have reserved blood flow throughout the heart. Unfortunately, that's not the case for every patient. Sometimes we have tissue death due to that. If we can't intervene in time, uh, unfortunately, it can cause effects to the left ventricle of the heart. 
In this example, this is a perfectly normal left ventricle in the way that it squeezes. However, on the right side of the screen, we find that this patient, through ischemic heart disease, now has ballooning of the apex of the left ventricle. And when this happens, um, we not only have reduced function of the heart, but we're also at now at an increased risk for having blood clots form with inside this area. And then also, if we look at like a medical textbook view, once we have this aneurysm that uh, then forms at the apex, these heart strings or the chordae tendinae, which support the structure of the mitral valve itself, get pulled. And when the valve then starts to get pulled, when it goes to contract, it won't seal properly, causing a huge leak with inside the left atrium. Now, specifically what we want to look at with this is making sure that there's no blood clots with inside the left ventricle. Where we most commonly find blood clots is going to be in this apex region of the LV. And when you have decreased contractility, the blood loves to start to pool right here and start to coagulate and cause a clot. Now, if you're somebody who, uh, you know, if you're driving down the street and you're looking at the clouds and you make out Mickey Mouse or Goofy in the clouds, us cardiac sonographers, we're kind of goofy. We also can do that and make out structures with inside our contrast images. So it's kind of cool. So, you know, as we've talked about echocardiography, you know, this is the bedrock of diagnosing heart failure. It's a, a test that uses high frequency ultrasound waves and it creates a moving picture of the heart. We can image in 2D, we can image in 3D, we can track blood flow. Now, looking at heart failure, we know that there is left-sided heart failure, there's right-sided heart failure. They can be intertwined and be bi biventricular. We can have cases that come on suddenly, and then there can also be cases that are chronic. Specifically looking at left-sided heart failure, it pertains to the left ventricle and the way that it squeezes and the way that it fills blood. When we look at the right side of the heart and looking for right-sided heart failure, we're looking at the right ventricle here and the way that the right ventricle squeezes. When we look at biventricular, we can see that the left side and the right side and how they work intertwine together. Now, in determining heart failure reduced EF or heart failure preserved EF, echo is the, the call to answer. Some equations that we get with echocardiography is we want to know what the stroke volume is, what the cardiac output is, and what the ejection fraction is. So stroke volume is the volume of blood pumped by the heart with each contraction. And we do a series of measurements throughout every single echo that can tell us what that stroke volume is. We also get cardiac output. Cardiac output is that stroke volume that we assess through measurements times the heart rate. And then we'll look at the ejection fraction, which by a series of measurements, measures the percentage of blood that gets pushed out with each heartbeat. Now with heart failure with reduced EF or an EF of less than 40%, the signs and symptoms that we typically get is that of shortness of breath and pulmonary edema, that fluid building back up into the lungs. We also see shortness of breath with exertion, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and peripheral edema. These uh, reduced ejection fraction pa patients have decreased contractility, either due to coronary artery disease or ischemic heart disease. They either have a volume overload because of that severe valvular abnormality, or even uh, cardiomyopathy, such as dilated cardiomyopathy, where the left ventricle will enlarge in size and not squeeze very well. This uh, in turn causes an increased afterload, which is the pressure against which the left ventricle must contract to eject the blood out. The LV will then hypertrophy, and then now there's an increase in oxygen, oxygen uh, demand with, an, with a decrease of oxygen supply, leading to ischemia. Other issues could be the hypertension or severe aortic stenosis as causes of that increased afterload. Now, heart failure with ejection fraction of less than 40% we get by measuring out the ejection fraction. And in this visual image here, we have our normal patient here. And then we have a patient who has the dilated left side of the heart 
with a poor overall squeeze. So we're really not seeing this interventricular septum and anterior lateral wall squeeze together really well. When we look at dilated cardiomyopathy, we often see those same characteristics. We see dilatation of the left ventricle, and then we see poor overall squeezing. With this ineffective pump, we can have several different issues. We can have issues that create something called pericardial effusion or fluid that then fills the pericardial space. We then have a, a large left ventricle. We have a poor squeeze. And then because of that dilated LV, this mitral valve does not like to close properly. And when we turn our color Doppler on, we can see an issue with the mitral valve because of that dilatation where the leaflets now do not coapt very well. So during systole, when the valve then closes, we see this large leak of blood that goes back into the left atrium, which reduces the efficiency of the heart. When we image these patients, it's not uncommon to see ICD or pacemaker leads with inside the heart. Um, so very cool that we're able to see that with inside the heart using echocardiography. And these leads are something that we need to pay attention to when heart failure or when your ejection fraction is low. Looking at valve disease even further, we can see that uh, in this patient, when we turn color on, we see a significant jet going back inside the left atrium. So when the heart contracts here, this valve then does not close properly, and we see severe mitral regurgitation, which then backs into the pulmonary veins, causes congestion with inside of the lungs. We'll do complementary views, such as the apical two-chamber view, so in this view, we'll also look at contractility of the heart. We'll look at the size of the left atrium and the way that that valve opens. When we use the complementary imaging, we can see in this view as well, we have a significant leak of blood that should be going one way that is then coming back towards us. Now, looking at ineffective pumping caused by valvular heart disease and even vice versa, we need to look at the aortic valve and the mitral valve. Now, I'll ask a question, what is this a symbol of for Mercedes-Benz? Now, what is the slogan or the motto of Mercedes-Benz? They call it the ultimate driving machine, right? And now when God was creating all of us, he gave us the ultimate pumping machine. So our aortic valve resembles the Mercedes-Benz. So now over time, if we don't take care of our body very well, we can develop something called severe aortic stenosis. Let me go back and play that. So we can develop severe aortic stenosis to where now our Mercedes is all crusty and thick and doesn't open really well. Now, here at St. Francis, we can do a procedure uh, called transcatheter aortic valve replacement or TAVR. And so the cardiologist uh, will introduce a wire inside the femoral artery, run that up past the aorta, insert that over that diseased aortic valve, and expand a new valve right over that diseased valve. And now we have increased blood flow, whereas before we now had huge increase in pressure in the left side of the heart, the left ventricle. In real time, we can image that in the echo lab. Uh, so here in this 3D image, we see a very thick calcified and restricted valve that does not open very well. And here in real time using 3D, we can watch this balloon that then expands and creates this new heart out for us. When we look in 2D imaging, this is the short axis view of the heart. We can see the stenting material right here on echo that's really bright. And now we have nice preserved leaflet mobility that then just took the place of the diseased valve. Really cool, right? Moving into mitral valve disease, in 3D imaging of the valve, we can see the anterior mitral valve leaflet, and then right below that is the posterior leaflet. When our valves open and close, they should seal properly. However, in certain conditions, like degenerative mitral valve disease or even ischemic, mitral, uh, ischemic uh, LV disease, we can have rupture of cords, that are attached to the mitral valve, or we can even have an issue with the leaflet itself. So in this view right here, this tissue is prolapsing back, and we also see torn cord through here. So in these patients, we then can image with 2D with a TEE probe, 
which then show us this valve coming together. But then these conditions, we actually see a large separation. And when this happens, we have a significant problem of uh, volume overload. Here in this video, we can actually see a video of mitral valve prolapse and how that valve prolapse back and forth and doesn't actually seal properly. When we image with echo, we can see with color imaging how, uh, how bad the leak is and what leaflet is actually affected. So in real time, as we put color on in this patient, we can see that we have the, uh, this is apical four chamber view. So this is the left side of the heart. This is the right side of the heart. And we're specifically looking at the mitral valve here. This is the anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflet. And as the heart squeezes, we should see the valve come together nicely. But unfortunately for this patient, we have an issue with this posterior leaflet prolapsing back into the left atrium here that then causes a massive leak that then wants to wrap around the entire left atrium. So what can we do for this? We can do the gold standard, which is a mitral valve repair, which the surgeon will go in, they will dissect or resect this tissue, stitch it together, and then put a band together that outlines sometimes the entire structure of the mitral valve or just the posterior leaflet. In real time 3D imaging here as well, we can see that band in 3D echo. Now in the old days, we used to just simply replace this mitral valve and we used to do this by a ball and cage method. So we would have this ball and when the heart would squeeze, the blood and the, the force of the blood in the heart would move this ball back and forth. This technology is largely out of date. Uh, I myself have never scanned a patient like this, but they still do exist as you can tell here. But now our newer technology here is something called a mechanical mitral valve replacement or a St. Jude bileaflet tilting disc. And this allows for more blood volume to go in and out uh, of the left side of the heart. The kickback for this is that you need long-term anticoagulation. Uh, the other method that we could do is a bioprosthetic valve. So this could be pig valve tissue, this could be cow tissue, um, and these patients do not need long-term like, uh, like heavy therapy, uh, blood thinning therapy. When we look at heart failure with mildly reduced EF, it's kind of this middle group that doesn't quite fit into heart failure with reduced EF or heart failure with preserved EF. These are patients who have a function of 40 to 49%. And in these patients, typically what we'll see are due to coronary artery disease. And as this video plays here, this is our normal heart again, and this is our diseased heart. So as this heart goes to contract, we can tell that over time through coronary artery issues, we now have dead tissue and we now have a huge problem up here. We have a thrombus. So as this then plays, we can see that as the heart contracts, as we see that the heart contracts, we can tell that this dense black area right here is blood clot. Now, if this was resembling uh, of the heart muscle itself, we would see some of these speckles inside of it. That would likely uh, tell us that this is actually a tumor invading the heart as opposed to thrombus. When we see this with echo and we see this real dark appearance, that tells us there's no blood supply to it because this is a thrombus. When we look on uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, these are patients who have an EF of more than 50%. And we see a lot of the same things uh, and we see a significant overlap. Specifically with these patients, the issue is not the squeeze itself, it's the filling of blood from the left atrium into the left ventricle. And these issues reside from diastolic dysfunction due to inability of the heart muscle, due to thickening of that heart muscle, to adequately relax. We also see this condition in restrictive cardiomyopathy, myocardial fibrosis, and even pericardial constriction. The heart failure with preserved EF is more particular in female than male. It has higher comorbidity burdens with patients who also have hypertension, atrial fibrillation, anemia, and COPD. When we image these patients in the echo lab, we start to see an increase in LV wall thickness. 
So in comparison to this normal, healthy, young individual, we can see that during uh, systole and even in diastole, we have significant thickening of the left ventricle. So now we're not allowing a lot of blood or the same amount of blood in this young patient to fill the left ventricle as we are now because we have a reduction in the overall cavity size. In diastolic dysfunction, when we look at this on every single echo, we look at filling pressures, we look at the way that the valve opens and closes. But specifically during diastole, we look at the mitral valve and when it opens. So as this mitral valve initially opens, we get about 80% of blood filling that left ventricle from the left atrium. As the valve then starts to close, it will do a double take and open again. That's from atrial contraction, pushing that last 20% of blood into the left ventricle. Now in cardiomyopathies, we have diastolic dysfunction or we have issues with filling. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, again, here's our normal patient on the left. This is our abnormal patient on the right. Right off the bat, we can tell that we have very significant thickening of the interventricular septum, which then causes a decrease in blood volume filling into the left ventricle. As we move into the short axis view, we can tell just how little or how small the heart muscle is. Now this is normal, just how small this is in comparison to how large this heart muscle is now affected the left ventricle. When we move to apical images on the side of the heart, we look at filling pressures and we look at blood moving in and out. And this patient in particular, I can't tell you the how size what the size of this cavity of the LV is. I don't know how much blood is getting in. I don't know how much blood is getting out. So what we can do is we can give something called ultrasound contrast. And this ultrasound contrast fills the left ventricle and highlights what is actually the heart muscle versus the blood volume. Now, when we look at hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient or this patient in particular, we now can tell what is actually blood volume and what is the overall thickness of the heart muscle itself. In some cases, we really can't explain what the uh, cardiomyopathy is. And so we have to then go to the cath lab with the cardiologist and do an endomyocardial heart biopsy. Now, in doing this, uh, the cardiologist will insert something called a biotome up to the interventricular septum on the right side of the heart. They will then grab a piece of tissue, and then as you're scanning, you can literally feel them yank that piece of tissue off their heart. It's kind of like a thud right to the chest on the probe. We can then take these samples and we can test them for certain types of cardiomyopathy. Moving on, one thing that we find, uh, unfortunately, in scanning patients is something called Takasubo cardiomyopathy or stress-induced cardiomyopathy or better, nine, better well known as broken heart syndrome. Now this broken heart syndrome mimics coronary artery disease. When we scan these patients, we can tell that we have preserved motion here in the squeeze down at the basal level. But when we get to the mid or even apical level of the heart, we see little to no contraction of the heart. Using a multimodality approach here, we can also see that under, uh, under CT here, we can then see thinning of the apical wall segments and only motion here at the base level. We can also show patients who have something called reverse Takasubo, where then the wall segments flip, where now you only have preserved motion in the apex, and now these segments here are all out. So when we look at um, in the cardiac cath, when we take these patients to the cath lab, we look at the LV gram. So they'll shoot die with inside the cavity of the left ventricle, and we'll look at the squeeze of the heart. And we can use this multimodality approach to only see squeezing here at the apex, everything else is out, just like as ex ex uh, shown here in our echo. Now, amyloidosis is a big condition in the world of cardiomyopathy, and this is a condition where abnormal proteins called amyloid proteins infiltrate the heart muscle. And this affects the structure and function of the heart, and it leads to shortness of breath, uh, fatigue, swelling, and heart failure. And so these stiffened ventricular walls prevent the heart from filling with blood properly and reduces the overall cardiac output. 
in Echo, we have a laundry list of red flags that we look for while scanning patients who potentially have amyloid. This is an example of an amyloid case that we had here at St. Francis. Right off the bat, we can tell that we have significantly hypertrophied heart muscle. We see that we have somewhat of a preserved contractility, but we also have something called a pericardial effusion. So we have fluid build up into the pericardial space and we have a dilated left atrium. When we look at further views of the heart, we can also see something that looks like speckling with inside the heart muscle itself, which is um, highly suggestive of amyloid protein infiltration. When we go to the four chamber view and image on the side, we can see that we have significant LV hypertrophy and it has also spread to the right side of the heart. So now we're starting to decrease that blood volume to the right side of the heart as well. We go through and obtain a series of views, the four chamber view, the two chamber view, and the three chamber view. And we then take these views and we do something on our ultrasound machines called global longitudinal strain. And global longitudinal strain looks at the cellular level in the way that those heart muscle cells contract and relax. Um, one that we look at is the deformation of the cell as it squeezes and relaxes. So if we think of uh, a rubber band that is 10 centimeters long and you stretch it out one centimeter, that's a 10% positive strain value. If you let that relax and it goes back one centimeter, that's a negative strain value, which is what we correlate to heart muscle when the heart muscle cells then contract. So on our ultrasound cards, we put our pictures then through this technology and through many, many years of research, we have different algorithms and different patterns that suggest us different things. And amyloidosis, the suggestive pattern is an ice cream sundae with the cherry on top. So this is something that we train everybody, whether they're newcomers into the field of echo, residents, physicians, this is a pattern to be on the lookout for suggestive of amyloidosis. Next thing is hypertensive heart disease. So significant hypertension can lead to left ventricular hypertrophy. And what uh, will happen then is you'll have left atrial enlargement. You will have a reduction in overall blood volume. And then your cardiac output will also be reduced. Now, treatment for these patients who have heart failure with preserved EFs, as recently uh, mentioned, there's really no current pharmacological therapy. You just have to treat the underlying disease, whether it's sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. Uh, but usually these patients also have uh, ICD placement or they'll have revascular revascularization uh, therapy. So as I mentioned earlier, we can do these echoes and when we look at the wires inside the heart, Sometimes if we have uh, patients who then have a reduction in overall ejection fraction, we can see overall blood clot formation on these structures. So if this will play. So as the wire moves back and forth, we can start to see small things flickering off of this wire, suggestive of blood clots now on the wires. So they will have to take this out and replace the wires. Now, you can have biventricular heart failure, and usually the most common cause of the right-sided heart failure is due to your left-sided heart failure through coronary disease, through valvular abnormalities that cause blood volume that leaks back into the uh, lungs. But um, one thing that we look at in doing echoes is do these patients have COPD? Do they have pulmonary hypertension? Have they had a history of uh, RVMI? or have they had significant valve disease that's related to the right side of the heart? Now we can have high pressures in the lungs, just like we can have systemic high blood pressure. And we can estimate that using echocardiography. So we use this called the Bernoulli equation, which takes the speed of the blood uh, plus the pressure coming from the inferior vena cava. So what we will do in the echo uh, is we will obtain a right-sided view of the heart we will then turn on color Doppler and we will watch and check for the amount of leak that leaks back into the right atrium during systole. We can then measure out 
what the peak arterial systolic pressure is. And then we can even measure the mean. Now, previously, I think it was uh, Dr. Sparrow or even Dr. Bardwaj, we talked about right heart cath being the gold standard for pulmonary hypertension. In some cases, we don't have to subject our patients to the invasive right heart cath. We, if we get uh, very good images, we can determine what that mean gradient is to diagnose pulmonary hypertension just by echo. When we look at valve disease, specifically the right side of the heart of the tricuspid valve, this is an image uh, in 3D looking at the three different leaflets of the tricuspid valve. We have the septal, the posterior, and the anterior. But certain conditions cause abnormalities in the way that that valve moves. This is a patient that we had not uh, long ago that had malcoaptation of all three leaflets. So when these leaflets do not close together and seal off the blood, you get a massive leak back into uh, the right atrium. Now, because of that, we can have right heart failure. And on echo, we can see that in the personal long axis view, when we measure these patients, uh, we can see that the right side of the heart is much larger than in the normal patient. And the buildup of the pressure in the right side of the heart then pushes on the interventricular septum. So as these patients' hearts try to relax, it gets pushed back into the left side of the heart, and we're not able to really relax our heart to increase blood flow to the rest of our body. When we look at the short axis view, we see that these patients also have an abnormal view of the heart here, where the right ventricle is much larger than the left, and as the heart tries to contract and relax, we should see a nice circle. But unfortunately, because we have such high pressures on the right side of the heart, we now start to see flattening of the interventricular septum. When we go to the apical four chamber view, we see dilatation of the right side of the heart in relationship to the LV. And then on our second image here, uh, it's not well visualized here, but we can start to see spontaneous echo contrast or smoke within the right side of the heart, telling us that we are now having backup of blood that's not being perfused through the body that can lead to blood clots. Now, in the echo lab, something that we'll do is an agitated saline study when we find right sides of the heart that are dilated and we can't figure out why. In this patient, we did that procedure, and as we introduce agitated saline through a three-way stopcock and into the right side of the heart, we see bubbles come into the right side of the heart that should be kind of filtered out through the right side of the heart in a matter of seconds. But when you have pulmonary congestion and uh, slow blood flow in the right side of the heart, we see a filling defect now up here in the apex as these bubbles come in. It's not filling all the way up into here. So this is starting to suggest to us that we could have a blood clot in the right side of the heart. We can also assess the filling pressures by looking uh, at the inferior vena cava. So that is the, the vessel that then brings blood back to the right side of the heart. When we see dilatation of this vessel uh, and then uh, assess for its collapsibility, if it's dilated and doesn't collapse, that tells us that we have high right-sided pressures in the heart. And so the big takeaways that I want you to guys uh, to come away with this uh, is that leading cause of hospitalization in Medicare age patients is due to heart failure. Mortality rate at the five year mark is around 50%. And echocardiography is really a cornerstone and bedrock to diagnosing heart failure. There are two different types. There's the heart failure with the reduced ejection fraction, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and echo is really good key and determining what's what. Well, we'll welcome up Ashley, who's going to talk about heart failure, device therapy, and echo. So very quickly, I'm just going to go over the different devices that we have here at St. Francis and how um, we play a role in that in echo. So we have multiple different devices that we use here, some short term and some long term. Just um, there's multiple different factors that go into what patient gets what. So the first one I'm going to talk about is an LVAD. 
we have a love-hate relationship with Elvad's more hate than love. Um, as you can see, this inlet is sewn in to the um, apex of the heart. It sucks out the volume of the LV and then it's placed back into the ascending aorta. Now, one of our main images that we take is what we call our apical images, um, and that's taken at the apex of the heart on the left side of the chest. So this inlet here creates a ton of artifact for us. So these patients are very hard to image, um, but it's very crucial um, that we get these certain measurements on these patients as it plays a big role in what speed their LVAD is at. This is typically used for a bridge to transplant patient um, for six to 12 months, but as Dr. Sparrow said, it is also used to um, further quality of life of these patients that are never gonna get on the transplant list. It's put in by our cardiovascular surgeons, and once you get one, it's indefinite. You cannot take it out. So one of the main things that we look at on ECHO with these LVAD patients is the position of the ventricular septum. Um, in every single ECHO report of these LVAD patients, you will see us comment on where the septum is placed. It'll either say midline, leftward shifted, or rightward shifted. So this first image here is a leftward shifted um, septum here. It's kind of leaning towards the left side, and the right, you can see that the right side looks a bit bigger than the left. This means that the speed is too fast. It's sucking the volume out of the LV too fast, um, and they need to slow it down and uh, get that septum back into the midline. Um, midline is our normal position, um, but sometimes it can lean a little leftward as well. And uh, the next one is rightward shifted. So this means that the speed is too slow. It's actually not sucking volume out fast enough, and it's creating too much volume in the LV. Um, and you can see that the septum is pushing up against the right ventricle. This is actually a measurement that we do on every single echo patient, but it's very important on our LVAD patients. Uh, we measure the left ventricle and diastole. and um, before we do these patients, we look at it, what it was on the prior echo. We look to make sure we see exactly where it was measured. Uh, that way we can compare to the prior echo and alert the attending if, if need be, if it's uh, significantly different. We also look at the valves for um, our LVAD patients. So the aortic valve plays an important part in these patients. We actually look at two different things. The first thing I'm gonna go over is aortic regurgitation. Uh, prior to getting the LVAD, if the patient has significant aortic regurgitation, they will actually put in what they call a park stitch. Um, if a patient has significant aortic regurgitation, that LVAD is sucking that volume out uh, of the LV and putting it into the ACE and aorta. And if there's regurgitation, majority of that volume is just falling back into the LV. Um, so the LVAD serving little purpose. So we actually, um, they will put in a park stitch when they put in the LVAD to help prevent that regurgitation. It's also something that we watch um, after they get the LVAD because it also can uh, give signs of any um, speed issues. This is what we call an M mode of the aortic valve. And so you can see the aortic valves open here. This is when the aortic valves closed and open. Now this line of color here is actually regurgitation. So this is something that we use to help um, determine the severity of the regurgitation. The other thing that we're worried about with the aortic valve um, is how often it's opening. Now with LVAD patients, the aortic valve doesn't really serve a purpose anymore. Uh, it doesn't need to open every cycle because it's not the one that's allowing flow to get into the ascending aorta. They do like to see it open every few beats um, just to help prevent with any clotting. Um, but you'll see in every single echo report of these LVAD patients, we will comment that the aortic valve is opening every three to four beats. It's not opening or it is opening every single beat. We also look at the mitral valve, um, just like any normal echo, we look at color, make sure there's no significant regurgitation, because then again, it is um, reversing the effects of the LVAD. We also look at the inflow cannula and make sure that the flow is, 
is functioning correctly. If the speed velocity, uh, if it's over two meters per second, then we are worried about an obstruction, aka a clot. So we will use CW, PW, and color Doppler to make sure that uh, the inflow cannula looks good. Here is a picture of color with the inflow uh, cannula. Lots of color artifacts. Again, this inflow cannula is our, our worst enemy. Um, so we will also use our echo contrast to rule out any clotting as well. This is a T image. When the LVAD is placed, they will put in um, the CRNA or the anesthesiologist will put in an ultrasound probe down the throat to get clearer images. Um, and so that's what you're seeing here. And this is the inflow cannula in the apex of the heart here. Much clearer images, but this is an invasive um, procedure. So thoracic images are preferred after the uh, initial LVAD was placed. Next one I'm gonna talk about is the impella. This is more of a short term. Um, it's more of a short term LVAD like uh, device. It sucks blood out of the LV and puts it into the ACE and DNA aorta. We play a key role in these. We actually go to the cath lab um, while these are placed, make sure that the placement is correct. And then we will follow these patients up to the ICU and take a look again and make sure that it was not moved during transfer. So this is a normal uh, heart without an LVAD. And then here you can see, um, not an LVAD, sorry, an impella. And then you can see the impella into the LV here. So we're measuring from the aortic valve to what we call the teardrop here. And that should be about three and a half to four centimeters with the short-term impella. The long-term impella that they put in axillary is about five centimeters. And uh, so this is actually a patient that I performed in the ICU. Uh, I went up just to do a routine check on this patient's impella and realized that uh, the impella was hardly in the LV. As you can see, there's nothing here. It's just past the aortic valve, so this is very bad. Um, I called the attending right away, and they came to the room, adjusted the position, and pushed it in, and now you can see that it is fully into the LV and, and functioning correctly now. Next one I'll just briefly touch on is the uh, balloon pump. We use this to help with perfusion to the coronary arteries and decrease afterload. Really in echo, we are just looking um, at LV function. We're keeping an eye on it with the device in place and when they do any weaning off of it. Um, again, we're keeping a close eye on any aortic regurgitation. This is a very key um, element in any of these devices. Next one I'll talk on is ECMO, um, two different types of ECMO. Um, again, in the OR, the um, TE, the esophageal probe, is placed by the CRNA or anesthesiologist, and it has helped um, guide the um, surgeons in putting that in. So we have VV ECMO, which is for respiratory failure, or VA ECMO for cardiorespiratory failure. Um, Sorry, just gonna quickly go through these. So here is a TE image of the um, ECMO, and this is the left atrium at the top, and then you see the atrial septum here, and this is the right atrium. This is actually the SVC here with the cannula coming in, and you can see with the color flow, um, it's nicely flowing into the right atrium. Uh, once the patient gets back up to the ICU, again, thoracic imaging is preferred, and this is a we will we will keep a close eye on LV and RV function because it will start to decrease with ECMO. And you can see here the left ventricle is not squeezing at all. You can see that echo con uh, spontaneous contrast for poor blood flow. Uh, we would give this patient contrast and to make sure there is no clot as well. Uh, we assess volume status again. So this is actually the IVC with the cannula coming in. We're looking at the color Doppler. And here is a 3D image that we use thoracically. It also helps with LV and LA volume status. This is the right ventricle um, in our subcostal view. It's kind of hard to see on this screen, but here you see this line here that is actually a clot formation. So again, one of the the big things that we're looking in these ECMO patients is clot formation. Uh, we look at any valvular insufficiency 
and uh, we want to do early detections of any complications to these machines. This image here, again, you can see that um, echo spontaneous contrast, and this is actually a clot forming in the left atrium. We also help with the weaning of ECMO. They'll slowly start to turn down the ECMO, and uh, we will look at the RV and the LV and make sure that they are um, starting to take over as they start to wean off that ECMO. Um, this is an image with weaning with non-reaction. You can actually start to see that spontaneous contrast again because the heart is not taking over as they're trying to wean this patient off of ECMO. And one last thing I just want to touch on, um, the echo machine is very um, sensitive to bubbles and our contrast is actually made up of micro bubbles. So it's uh, whenever we give these patients contrast, which it's very important that we do because again, we're ruling out clots, um, we will always have the RN or the perfusionist um, involved to make sure they know we're giving it. And it does usually set off the alarm of the echo, ECMO machine. Um, and it's just something that we have to be aware of that it, it will set off the alarm. It doesn't normally turn off the ECMO machine. Um, it has been reported in two cases, but again, not common. So yes, any questions? Yeah. I just said when you find the clots, do you do refer them to their doctor? Is there a way that they go in and dissipate them? Uh, it's really dependent on each patient. Um, and that's not something that we're, you know, we call the attending and let them know. Uh, and then that, that goes beyond our scope of practice. But it usually depends on each patient. Um, usually they have to be taken off those devices right away because you don't want to dislodge those clots into the lungs or the brain. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.